Hezekiah became king at age 25. And after 14 years, he becomes deathly ill. You're going to read about that. How he prays and God gives him another 15 years. So 25 and uh, 30 <laughs> is what? 25 and 30. 55? So he dies at about 54 years old. Still by our standards in the prime of life. But imagine at 39. Definitely in the prime of life. And he could have been God. I'm not sure how the last 15 years turns out. But they're not as good as the first 14 years. He has no descendants. It seems like. When he is told that he is ill and he will die. And he starts to get nervous. And I think that somewhere in the next 15 years, he starts a family formation thing. and say, okay, I need to make sure that this looks good. And his son Manasseh becomes king at 12, which means three years after he becomes ill, his son is born. His son becomes king at 12. And if you look at my table, Manasseh is the longest reigning king in Judah. And he was king for 55 years. I'm going to start reading. I think we have enough context for what's going on. So we're focused on King Hezekiah. Generally described as a good guy who has several lapses in judgment that are fatal in this particular setting. Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, was one of the more prominent kings of Judah. He became king at the age of 25, and his reign included the period when the kingdom of Israel came under Assyrian captivity. Israel, the northern kingdom. And when God delivered Jerusalem from the Assyrian siege in chapter 19 of 2 Kings. Hezekiah was still in his prime, not yet 40 years old, when Isaiah delivered God's message to him that he would die. Hezekiah wept and prayed to God. Before Isaiah had left the middle court of the palace, God heard the, and answered Hezekiah's prayer. God's answer included the promise of 15 more years for Hezekiah as king of Judah. The second portion of today's scripture deals with an apparent collusion of two vassals, Judah and Babylon, against their overlord, Assyria. A prophecy of rebuke for a king whose good judgment seemed to fail him and his response which seemed inappropriate for a good leader. So there's a lot of intrigue in this passage. The first part of the passage ends at verse 11. In fact, if you were to look at the account in Isaiah chapter 38 contains the first story and the rest of what we read is in chapter 39. So the dividers of scripture did a good job in Isaiah, separating them into two chapters. But in 2 Kings, they did not. So it seems like a run-on, and you have to remind yourself that there is an actual division. In fact, the dividing words at verse 12 are, at that time. So you have to translate what at that time means. Sometime later, at the same time. Anyway, that's where we're headed today. So again, I mentioned the passages are 2 Kings chapter 20, 1 through 19, Isaiah chapter 38 and 39, and the fast-forward, shortened version in 2 Chronicles chapter 32. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus and all that he means to us, that you have sent a righteous king, a faithful king, a king who is a good example 100% of the time. As we study the life of King Hezekiah and his own lapses, dear God, and we look at our own lives, we pray that you will help us to do what he did, to call on you. But to call on you constantly, dear God, so that you can prove yourself faithful to us. Forgive us because we sin in thought, word and deed. Forgive us because we have lapses in judgment, but dear God, be our guide. Help us to call on you for grace, for favor, for knowledge, for insight, so that we can do your will at all times. Be with us and bless us as we study your word today. For Christ's sake. Amen. If you want, the Second Chronicles 32 passage has, as I said, a very concise version of this. And I'm going to write down the verses 24 through 33. If you will bear with me, I'll read a few verses from Second Chronicles chapter 32. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. He prayed to the Lord, who answered him and gave him a miraculous sign. But Hezekiah's heart was proud, and he did not respond to the kindness shown him. Therefore the Lord's wrath was on him and on Judah and Jerusalem. Then Hezekiah repented of the pride in his heart, as did the people of Jerusalem. Therefore the Lord's wrath did not come on them during the days of Hezekiah. Hezekiah had very great wealth and honor. And he made treasuries for his silver and his gold and for his precious stones, spices, shields, and all kinds of valuables. 
He also made buildings to store the harvest of grain, new wine, and olive oil. And he made stalls for various kinds of cattle and pens for the flocks. He built villages and acquired great numbers of flocks and herds, for God had given him very great riches. Verse 30. It was Hezekiah who blocked the upper outlet of the Gihon Spring and channeled the water down to the west side of the city of David, Jerusalem. He succeeded in everything he undertook. But when envoys were sent by the rulers of Babylon to ask him about the miraculous sign that had occurred in the land, God left him to test him and to know everything that was in his heart. A little different perspective here. His pride (laughs) and God leaving him. And then the last days not being as glorious as the first days. But he is still considered to be a good king. And uh, let us see what we can learn for our own lives. So again, for those who came in late, and I don't mean any aspersion by that, we are looking at Hezekiah, and we're looking at his life, summarized in Second Kings chapter 16 through 20. And we mentioned, in fact, if you look at the years of his reign, you will see they run from 716 B.C. to 687 B.C. And those of you who are good scholars would know that the fall of Israel has occurred in this period of time. Some scholars say it is prior to the fall, because even after the fall, Assyria allowed Israel to have its own kings. Obviously, they were vassals of the king. How do you rule these people? You know, you let a puppet king be there. And even... In Judah, when Babylon takes over, they put puppet kings in place to maintain the peace until they eventually sent governors who were Babylonians once they realized that they needed more and better control. So, first question. Just after the Lord delivered Judah from the threat of an Assyrian siege, Hezekiah became ill to the point of death. What was Hezekiah's response When Isaiah announced in verse 1 that Hezekiah was going to die. Take a look at verse 2. What do we see there? Scripture says, he turned to the wall. He prayed. He wept bitterly. Do you have any thoughts on his prayer in verse 3? And do you have any thoughts on God's response to his prayer? In verses 5 and 6. Verse 3. He says, remember Lord... How I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion. I want to say wholehearted obedience. And I've done what is good in your eyes. Very short prayer, but there are three things that he says in this prayer. I've been faithful, I've been wholeheartedly devoted to you, and I did good in your eyes. How would you assess this prayer? I. Mm-hmm. I think it's not all about him. Mm-hmm. Okay. He's saying, God, I've been... I did everything right. He's bargaining. He's bargaining. Where do you see the bargaining? Well, he's saying, look, these are all the things that I have done. Mm -hmm. Can you heal me? How did he do that bargaining? Weeping bitterly. He's speaking with his tears. He doesn't actually mouth the words, but he does send a signal. There's an expectation that he had lived right. Expectation. He's only 39 years old. He has no ear as yet. He's thinking, okay, well, all of my ducks are not in a row. They don't have everything lined up yet. And he's been a good king. He has won battles. He has managed from age 25 to age 39 to get it done. The people love him. God has given him victory. And just prior to this incident, God had given him the greatest victory. So he is still on, okay, God, thank you for this great victory. And then he becomes deathly ill. Yes. And he would have had a typical Jewish mindset at the time, which is, if you do what is right, then the Lord will bless you. I will bless those, you know, all of that. And if you do what is wrong, Deuteronomy 30, you're going to get the curses. And so for him, it would have been absolutely shocking to think, I have been wholeheartedly devoted to you, which is really what it outlined in those passages of Deuteronomy. And I've done what's good in your eyes. And so the curses or being, you know, plagued with the things that the Egyptians get, that shouldn't be happening to me. So he might be very confused about what's going on or thinking maybe there's something I didn't do or should have done. And I don't know why this bad situation has befallen me. The perennial question of... Rabbi, why do bad things happen to good people? But only God knows the heart. So he might be saying on the outside, you know, if you look at, see, check, 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 do it right. God knows the heart. 
It's not the first time Hezekiah's prayed. Because if you go back in <laughs> chapter <laughs> in 19, he, he has a much longer prayer, which results in Sennacherib not defeating the city. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like he's on a... He has conversations with God on a, on a fairly regu regular basis when you compare him with some of the other kings. The incident that Major Linda mentions there is God sending an angel and wiping out Sennacherib's army of 158,000 soldiers. Miraculously. And I was thinking, that's a lot of dead bodies. But when he tried to lay siege to Jerusalem, notice he came down on the Mediterranean coast. I should mention that down here, somewhere down here is Egypt. And Judah had an alliance with Egypt. Okay, you know how you are in this situation. Okay, if we go to war, you come with us. The same way Britain had to go to war with France because that was the alliance that they had in the wartime. I mean, the countries do that. But he had this alliance, and Sennacherib said, okay, I'm going to come down and cut them off and then approach from the south. Let me see what you're going to do now. Yes. I can understand uh, in his distress, as a guy praying this prayer, I don't understand why God didn't say, well, okay, but I already made up my mind. Why, why did I change God's mind? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. It's, it's not, I'm not qualified <laughs> to answer that. Because God sees from one end of eternity to the other. It's just like one big picture. Yeah. And therefore... He did it so we could have this conversation today. Yes. I would say that it wasn't a changing of the mind, per se. Because we don't see any more of this good guy, Hezekiah, thing manifesting itself. And scripture says that sometimes God grants her requests, but adds leanness to the soul. You pray something and God grants the request. Yes, no, in a way, sometimes the yes is not really a glorified yes, but okay, and everything will turn around. Okay? I will relent. But it doesn't really change much of what is going on. So at some level, the good king Hezekiah has something cooking in him that needs to be checked. Remember for the past few weeks I've been saying the Bible is one story. It's about God. And us. And as good as I might look this morning. <laughs> God knows the inside that none of you know. So we have to understand that there's nothing we can hide from God. That God will give us the blessing. He will give us the victory. He will give us what looks good. And he will even forward his agenda to us. Even though we are imperfect. I wonder why. Well, that's what the Lord said. He didn't say he's doing it for Hezekiah. He said, I will defend the city for my sake. I send the sake of my servant David. Mm -hmm. David, the first good king. Hezekiah, one of the... Hezekiah is probably ranked very close to David. Yes. And also, you know, there's a sense of imminent death. Because the Lord didn't say you're going to die in the next ten minutes. Yeah. He just said you're going to die. And Hezekiah, been, I mean, if the Lord told me I was going to die, I'd probably be getting it be happening in the next hour or so. So he's having an appropriate response to the Lord saying, you're going to die. But the Lord doesn't put a time frame on it. And yet, even with those 15 years, he still didn't make it to so eternal life on this side. He still had to go through the death process like all of us. The Lord just added a little more time. So I don't really interpret this as the Lord changing his mind as much as the Lord postponing what is an inevitable inability for us to sustain life on this side. Isaiah chapter 38 has a different perspective. Another perspective, I should say. Isaiah 38, verse 9. A writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, after his illness and recovery. I'll read a few verses. Verse 10. I said, in the prime of my life, must I go through the gates of death and be robbed for, of the rest of my years? I said, I will not again see the Lord myself in the land of the living. No longer will I look at my fellow man or be with those who now dwell in this world. Like a shepherd's tent, my house has been pulled down and taken from me. Like a weaver, I have rolled up my life and he has cut me off from the loom. Day and night you made an end of me. I waited patiently till dawn. But like a lion, he broke all my bones. Day and night you made an end of me. I cried like a swift or thrush. I moaned like a morning dove. My eyes grew weak as I looked to the heavens. I am being threatened. Lord, 
come to my aid. That's the first part of his song. The rest is, after he is healed, he says, what can I say? He has spoken to me, and he himself has done this. I will walk humbly all my years because of this <coughs> anguish of my soul. Lord, by such things people live. And my spirit finds life in them too. You restored me to health and let me live. Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered much anguish. In your love you kept me from the pit of destruction. You have put all my sins behind your back. For the grave cannot praise you. Death cannot sing your praise. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your faithfulness. The living, the living, they praise you. As I am doing today. Parents tell their children about their, your faithfulness. The Lord will save. He will save and we will sing with stringed instruments all the days of our lives in the temple of the Lord. Nice perspective. His response at being healed. He's saying, okay, thank you God. The first part talks about how he is afraid to die. And the rest, thank you God for giving me a few extra years. We are given added perspective. So my question asks, question number two, do you have any thoughts on Hezekiah's response, on God's response, and uh, Hezekiah's prayer? So now we have an added perspective here, after the fact. <coughs> Hezekiah is writing this song, which I'm sure was sung as he commemorated what had happened. He was faithful. He was wholeheartedly devoted. He did good in the eyes of God. And God extended his reign by another 15 years. It is interesting because once you know how much longer you're going to live, the actuarial science that kind of works it out for you. Okay, well, this is what's going to happen, and here's what you need to do. And he had no heir to say, so he probably had a, a wife or several wives, but he got a son who was 12. He, he probably did the calculation. Okay, well, this kid will be 12 when I die, and is he ready? To be the ruler of Israel. I don't know what kinds of questions are going through his mind. But having that idea of the end kind of changes your perspective on things, doesn't it? And I think that it weighed heavily on him, knowing that his days were numbered. It changed his perspective because we don't see the guy who was going out there and getting it done the same way we saw before that when he went out there and he was asking God to give him the victory because God told him. He's just as the Lord told other kings in the past and told Joshua, you don't have to worry. I will fight your battles. God had told him the same thing. Not in the second king's passage, but in one of the other passages. And that's why the angel of the Lord can come and strike 158,000 soldiers and they approach Jerusalem to capture the city. God was fighting the battles. But now with your days numbered, it kind of changes things. Your mind is thinking, okay, so what do I need to do? And I think that the pride that we see coming up later is part of that, okay, let me assess where I'm at. And uh, uh, sometimes that is not a good thing. Keep your eyes on Jesus. We skip forward question number three to chapter 21. You don't have to, but I just mentioned that that's where we pick up the story of Manasseh. And Second Kings 21 verse 1 tells us that Manasseh, Hezekiah's son, was 12 years old when he became king. So I asked if that added any insight to Hezekiah's prayer. Because insights are personal. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought of that question just to say, well, when we know more of the story, does it alter our perspective as we think through who this person is? And I wrote that question before I went to the other passages. And said, you know, okay, let me find out how much more is mentioned. I saw this wealth of extra stuff. So I thought that what I told you, so far all we have is what I told you about this son being born three years later. And his own perspective on, okay, I have no heir, now I have an heir. Who turns out, as I said, to be a bad king? But here he is thinking, okay, how do I manipulate the situation? God is in control. But Hezekiah was trying to take some control over the situation. Like we do when we are saying, okay, I have these issues. How do I sort them out? It's too bad that Hezekiah didn't plan ahead enough to make sure that the people who were around Manasseh were good, God-fearing people. Because at 12 years old, you may have some intelligence, but you did not enough to run a whole country, even, in, even back in this day and age. He had to have advisors, and unfortunately, 
from what we see of Manasseh, I don't think his advisors were very good ones. So if he had actually passed at age 39, 14 years after he became king, God would have put someone in place. But remember, this whole mess is rebellion against God. When God says, I'm your king. And they're saying, we want a king just like the surrounding nations. And God allows them to have a king, which takes their eyes off their king. We're going to fast forward because all of this is leading back to our soon coming king, Christ. And I think that it goes full circle here. Okay, we're going to give a period. Okay, this story seems to be about Judah, but the story is about us and how we ought to have a right attitude towards God. Question number four. What might the sick king Hezekiah wanting a sign that the Lord would heal him? Tell us about his prayer. So if you back up to 2 Kings chapter 20 passage, verse 8. Hezekiah had asked Isaiah, what will be the sign that the Lord will heal me? That I will go up to the temple of the Lord on the third day from now. Let's think about that for a minute. Why is he wanting a sign? He's told the Lord will heal you. That's what I'm There must like, be some doubt. You have that real close relationship with somebody. The Lord tells you, I'm going to heal you. That's all I would need. And the verse 7 above it said that, the, that he recovered. Uh-huh. It would be like... I'd be praising the Lord at that point in time. I think verse, asking for a sign. verse 8 and verse 7 should be flipped because verse 8 says he had asked Isaiah. So he asked the question ahead of time. As he was there, deathly ill, he's saying, okay, so can, can I get a sign that God is actually going to heal me? He's showing signs of doubt. Humanness? Yeah. His humanness is showing through. He's saying, you know, well, you, you just told me. The prophecy is that I'm going to die. Yeah. So now Isaiah had barely made it outside. And he's coming back and said, okay, well, God heard your prayer. Yeah, he believed in what he said he was going to die. Why is he not believing him wholeheartedly what he says he's going to live? It is sufficiently positive. Because if God says you're going to die, and then a few minutes later you hear, okay, you're not going to die, you're going to get 15 more years. You might say, well, okay, so which is it? Am I going to die or am I going to get 15 more years? The prophets are supposed to be 100% correct. So at some you just level. said you're going to die. Right. Now, how can you be the other two? Yeah. Maybe it wasn't God. He was, maybe he wasn't full, I don't know, Lady Isaiah. It's certainly a I mean, conflicting sides I, of the same situation within minutes. You're going to die, you're not going to die. So give me a sign. If someone were to come and tell you two different things very quickly, one after the other. I don't think it would be God that I would doubt. I think it would be the proof that, you know... The credibility there certainly comes into question. And he's saying, okay, well, can I get a sign? Tell me, am I going to die or am I going to live? See, a lot of times when people mistrusted God's statement about what's going to happen, God did something wrong. Sometimes they would <laughs> mute <laughs> and other things happen to them before their unbelief. His concern was. This prophet has said two different things. Now, which is it, guy? <laughs> and if I'm correct that verse 7 comes before verse 8, sorry, verse 8 comes before verse 7, then the case of things have not yet been prepared okay. to apply to his situation. Yeah. Well, even if we leave it in the context it is right now, and then we apply it in the New Testament context, as I said, that in the commentary that I read, that it could be the new... Testament believers' perspective on eternal life. And so it says, they did so and applied it to the boil, and he recovered. He may not have perceived that he had been healed. In other words, the healing has taken place, but he has not caught up in himself yet that he is fully restored. And that's not very different than our own salvation experience. There's a lot of promises and a lot of things that the Lord says about who we are, about the righteousness of Christ. So, for example, I may be saved, and the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Well, I might still be doing some of those old things, even though the Bible says all things have become new. And so in asking for that sign... That may show just the humanity. It's like, I've been healed, but I don't really understand. Just like when we're saved, 
I've been saved. I've been healed spiritually. I've been made alive. But I don't really understand all that has happened to me. And so he's responding the way I think is appropriate. I, I've been, I've recovered, but I don't get it. So let me use or, or ask for something that would help me to understand what just happened to me. Because the healing is something that takes place on the inside, much like the New Testament believers. And that's a question number five. It's probably moot now. What purpose would having a sign of the impending healing serve? Confirmation. Take away your doubts. Mm-hmm. Take away your doubt. It increases your faith. Also adds to the testimony, doesn't it? As you tell people, you say, I asked the Lord for a sign. And he oh, really? I mean, it certainly makes for a better telling of your testimony. Well, it's also something that <coughs> Isaiah couldn't do. I mean, Isaiah and his poultice have put it on him, which probably was as part of the healing. But Isaiah couldn't make the sun go back. And he was looking for something that Isaiah, that was not coming from Isaiah. Beyond the shadow of a doubt. But beyond the shadow of a doubt. Appropriate for this one. Uh, it, Again. As you are looking to line your ducks up in a row, and you realize I have no descendant, no ear here as yet, I have no, I'm not ready for this. You kind of want a little more. Even Jesus would say, Father, if it's possible, remove this cup from me. Then he has to reflect, so never reflect, it's not my will, but your will be done. So in our humanity, we can get this state of, I really don't want this thing to happen, Lord. And then, hopefully, on reflection. So, seeking a sign has been criticized several times, but it gives you an assurance. And I don't know how many of us have actually been going to ask the question, say, well, Lord, you know, can you give me an assurance? A sign and an assurance might be very close to each other. The sign doesn't need to be a physical, visual sign. It could be, just comfort my heart, that all will be well. Or that it will be as Scripture says. Or that I will actually make it to heaven. Give me that comfort. Because there might be times I would say, well, Lord Jesus. If the, um, the Apostle Paul would go from being greater than the Apostle to the Lord and the least of the Apostles and saying, you know, I'm not sure sometimes how much more I would say, you know, I hope that I make it in. But Scripture has said that he died for the whosoever will. And that he's given us salvation. So we should not doubt that. Even as we live. What's Paul saying in Romans chapter 6? Should we continue in sin because there is grace? God forbid. We're going to go to the second passage. If we were in Isaiah, it would be chapter 39. And we don't have a lot of time for this. And maybe it's a good thing because we see the other side of Hezekiah here. Question number 7. Verse 12 tells us that the Babylonian king, Marduk Baladan, sent Hezekiah letters and a gift because he had heard of Hezekiah's illness. I should tell you that in Isaiah it says heard of his illness and his recovery. So that adds to it. Judging by Hezekiah's response, what other motive might the king of Babylon have had for sending the gifts and the letters? I should tell you that this guy, Marduk, was a revolutionary. Babylon was under the influence of Assyria. It was all the Assyrian Empire. And he wanted to rebel against Assyria. He had just witnessed what God had done. 158,000 soldiers wiped out just like that. And he had heard that Hezekiah was deathly ill. And that Hezekiah's God had healed him. He's thinking, hmm, 500 miles away he's hearing all this. I don't know, the news travels that fast. Was that a text message? (laughs) <laughs> he prepares letters and a gift for his envoys to take to Hezekiah. Meanwhile, I'll tell you that Sennacherib had sent letters to Hezekiah to say, oh, by the way, your God, he's not going to save you. I'm going to come and take you over. And he conquered all of the other towns, the fortified cities in Judah. He was coming for Jerusalem, and God acted as Hezekiah's prayer to save the land. So letters can come from a king who's trying to take you over, or they can come from a king who's trying to seek an alliance with you. 
and Marduk was trying to get into an alliance. He said, okay, uh, is that guy up there in the north, in Nineveh, who thinks he is in control? Can we, I can see what your God just did for you and for your people. So can we create an alliance here so we can come against Assyria? That was part of the explanation for why he sent these letters and the gift. I'm not sure what the gift was. The get well card, I'm sure it wasn't there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Early <fall> <laughs> but he was seeking this alliance with Hezekiah. And uh, he did not send a threat. Since he was a revolutionary, he could have threatened Judah as well. But he had just seen what God had done. Oh, 158 soldiers of... Why do it like that? Oh, no. I need to be in alliance with this guy. We, his God can help us to overcome. <coughs> One big kingdom at this point in time. With many vassals under him. Many underlords. And then Assyria is the overlord. That's what empire is, right? Like Britain. The sun doesn't set on our empire. In every part of the world we have territory. And we are proud of this. So Sennacherib was very proud of his... He was probably one of the greatest Assyrian kings. So he was no small fry. And he was certainly looking forward to telling these little guys, this is the southern and eastern ends of his kingdom. You're trying to fortify it. He knows that Egypt wants to be in alliance with, and has been in alliance with Judah. So he's trying to cut that off. And I'm not sure what he's doing out here in Babylon. But he's trying to secure himself. And now these guys at the southwestern end and the southeastern end of his kingdom are trying to form an alliance against, against him. By the way, Sennacherib's end comes very quickly. After this news, 158,000 of your soldiers have just been wiped out. He retreats, and he goes back to Nineveh. Scripture tells us he is in his temple praying to his God, and two of his sons come and kill him. I'm not sure why. A third son becomes the new king, but two of his sons come and take him out for some reason that is not clearly articulated in Scripture. Question number eight. We have about four minutes left. And this is the part that is almost disappointing to me. What makes showing all this, all in the storehouses, in the treasury, and in all of the kingdom an appropriate response to receiving letters and a gift from a foreign king? Why is Hezekiah showing off all that he has to this person he doesn't even know who sends two envoys or three envoys? Hey, look at what I got here. Come, you want to see all my stuff? What makes that an appropriate response for Hezekiah? Well, is he doing it to be prideful of himself or to show him what God has done for him? Hmm. Okay. Well, maybe he's showing well, the scripture says that God left him to test him. To test him. And to know everything that was in his heart. So who are we without God? <laughs> Our human nature, you know? Oh, wretched man that I am. We need God. Because when God left him, we saw this other person that we didn't know was there yet. I just had a question about why did God have to leave him to test him and know everything that was in his heart? I thought God knew. I was going to say it was maybe he was showing he was he was showing this guy what what God had given him what all God had given him. God had left him it for testing, maybe that was part of the test with him letting him know this is this is what my God has given me. That's not what he said. Isaiah, no, Isaiah comes in no. shortly after and says, uh, "By the way, buddy, what did you just do? Oh, okay. What did you just do?" And and Hezekiah says, when he answers the question, there is nothing among my treasures right. that I did not okay. show them. Not, there's nothing among God's treasures I didn't show. Right. All about God. God knows who we are. Because he created us. A few weeks ago I quoted a Larnell Harris song. Were it not for grace. I could tell you where I've been. Walking down some pointless road to nowhere. With my salvation up to me. I know how that would go. The battles I would face. Forever running. But losing the race. We're not for grace. That's great. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for what it does for us, how it keeps us from falling away and doing things that are not pleasing to you. Dear God, please don't leave us. Help us to cling to you. Help us to understand that the world's attractions are nothing compared to what you have in store for us. Hold us in the hollow of your hand. Protect us, dear God. 
with all the protection that we need. And more than anything here, God, give us that testimony that we can be a light for others to see you, especially in this season. Help us to shine the light of Jesus. And may we do so in a way that uplifts you and draws others to you even more. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.